Good afternoon. I'm Tom Adams, president of Encore Learning, and I'll be moderating today's discussion of uh, the fascinating new book, Believers, Love and Death in Iran, written by Mark Grossman and John Limber. The book is a spy novel set against the background of U.S. relations with Iran from the time of the Iranian Revolution in 1979 to modern times, a roughly 40-year period. I found it to be a real page turner with a great ending. Don't expect a historical novel or a Tom Clancy novel. The book reimagines history in places in order to have a coherent and riveting spy tale. The characters are artfully developed and the atmosphere in post-revolutionary Tehran is well portrayed. The two authors are as fascinating as is the book. I've known Mark Grossman for over 40 years. We entered the Foreign Service together in 1976. And when I learned from Mark's wife, Mildred Patterson, who is a vice president of Encore Learning and was also a distinguished diplomat in the consular field in her own right, that Mark and John had written a novel, I immediately thought a talk with the two authors would make for a great special event for Encore Learning and our partner, the Arlington County Public Library. Ambassadors Grossman and Limbert reached the most senior levels of the State Department in their careers. Ambassador Grossman served as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the third ranking position in the State Department, and normally the top position held by a career official. From, 19, from 2001 until his retirement in 2005, when he joined the Cohen Group, serving as its vice chairman. In his 29 years in the Foreign Service, Mark also served as the Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, the Director General of the Foreign and Civil Service at the State Department, and the U.S. Ambassador to Turkey from 1994 to 1997. Mark achieved the highest rank in the Foreign Service, Career Ambassador, which is the State Department's version of a four-star general. Ambassador John Limbert grew up in Washington, D.C., and he collected three degrees from Harvard, the last a PhD in history and Middle Eastern studies. He made his first visit to Iran in 1961 while his parents worked there for the U.S. Agency for International Development. He returned to Iran as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1964 and taught at Pavlavi University from 1969 to 1972. Uh, that university's name has, by the way, been changed to Shiraz University. Um, he speaks Persian fluently. In his 34-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, he served mostly in the Middle East and Islamic Africa, including posts in Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Guinea, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. He served as the president of the American Foreign Service Association, the Foreign Service Employees Union, and as ambassador to Mauritania. Ambassador Limbert was among the last diplomat, American diplomats to serve in the American Embassy in Tehran. He holds the department's highest award, the Distinguished Service Award and the department's award for valor, which he received in 1981 after 14 months in captivity as a hostage in Iran, along with 52 other Americans. Ambassador Limbert's wife, Parvana, is a naturalized American citizen of Iranian descent. Since retirement, he has taught at the U.S. Naval Academy in Princeton. Both Ambassador Grossman and Ambassador Limbert's retirement careers were interrupted when they were asked to return to the State Department by Secretary Hillary Clinton. Ambassador Grossman served as the U.S. Special Representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan for almost two years, beginning in February 2011, replacing Ambassador Richard Holbrook. Ambassador Limbert was the first appointed, or was the first ever appointed uh, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iran when he returned. I could go on for an entire hour describing the numerous accomplishments, awards, other publications, and service of these two diplomats, but I think we should pivot to the book. The authors are going to give a talk about uh, how they came about writing a book, and then uh, they would be glad to answer your questions which uh, again, uh, please put in the Q&A function. And I'm gonna start things off by uh, asking the first question. Uh, how did you two meet and decide to collaborate on this book? Please. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Tom, if you'd allow me, I'll go first and then uh, make a few comments and ask John to chime in if that'd be okay. Sure. Uh, 
first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Tom. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction, and especially the very gracious review of the book. We appreciate it. Uh, people have been enormously generous about uh, the book, and uh, that you that you have as well. Thank you very much, and thank you for being president of such a great organization. Um, when we heard that Encore Learning might be interested in having us, we said absolutely. Um, a great institution uh, in our community, and we thank you for that. And may I also thank the Public Library, another community pillar. Uh, I know in the 44 years I've been an Arlington resident, I've been an enthusiastic uh, user of the library, and we thank them for joining us here today as well. Um, Tom, the answer to your question is that some years ago, I, I had an idea, like two sentences of an idea. Uh, and the two sentences were, what if, what if, there had been one more Foreign Service officer in Tehran on November the 4th, 1979, the day the hostages were taken, and that he or she uh, didn't get picked up, and that he or she was able then to stay uh, in Iran and work on behalf of the United States. And the second thought was, what if we were able, a little bit, a bit like Forrest Gump or other historical fiction that you've read, we were able to put this person into the major events in U.S.-Iran relations uh, over a period of years, and then, Tom, as you said, uh, bring the story up to the present uh, as well. As I say, this idea rattled around in my head for a while, um, and I realized I, I simply couldn't do this on my own. I didn't know enough about Iran, and although I participated in a minor way as a junior person on the Washington end in the hostage crisis, and I just didn't know enough about it to do it on my own. And so one day I took, asked John Limbert if he'd like to meet me for lunch at Zetinya, the lovely restaurant there in Washington, D.C., and I told him about my idea and asked if he'd like to join me and uh, be, a, be a partner in this. And so uh, over a period of a couple of years, uh, we worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and uh, we're lucky enough to find a wonderful, generous publisher, um, and in July of this year, had a chance to put, to put the book out. I, I would just say, if I could, um, you know, one of the things that people have said is, you know, why do this? You know, what, what, was the, what was your purpose? And the main purpose here was really to tell a good story. Um, we thought we had a good story um, and we wanted to tell it. And the second was to honor the Foreign Service, people who serve in the Foreign Service and all of the other people who serve abroad for the United States of America. And those of you, those of your readers who, or those of your listeners who've read the book know that we dedicated the book to colleagues in the Foreign Service and also to those others who serve. Um, we also were very interested in putting a woman uh, in a central role in a spy novel. When we started this, we read lots and lots of spy novels, and you can't find anybody who's central to this. And I must say we were very much um, uh, inspired by this wonderful book, Nonfiction, uh, A Woman of No Importance uh, by, by uh, Sonia Purnell. And we thought, you know, this is a great thing that we could do. And if you look now, that there's sort of more... Uh, women in these positions, but we, we wanted to put her, put a woman central uh, to these questions. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a State Department memo. We didn't run and write 500 pages of a briefing memo or an action memo, and I'm sure lots of people on this call will recognize that. And we wanted to have fun. We wanted to have fun doing it. We wanted to have fun uh, with people, and I hope that people have a good time reading it. And people have been generous so far with their reviews on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, and so uh, we've been very happy with it. I'll say one more thing before I turn it over to John, uh, and that is to say that one of the questions that we always get is, so at the end of this time, after you wrote this work together, were you still speaking to each other? Um, and the answer to that question is very happily, yes, we were. Um, we had a great time doing this together. And to prove it, I'm going to turn this over to John Limbert. Well, thank you, but thank you, Mark. And uh, let me join let me join Mark in uh, thanking uh, thanking our kind kind host. We were uh, Arlington uh, Arlington residents uh, for about uh, for um, for about sixteen years. Had a wonderful time there. Made uh, made lots of friends until um, you know family family reasons uh, drove us to relocate to New York relocate to New York City. But uh, we have great great memories of Arlington, uh, of Arlington, of all the wonderful activities there. Uh, no, Mark uh, came with this idea, um, uh, with this germ of, a, of an idea, um, which I guess is the basis for most fiction writing, which is what if. Um, and my reaction 
was, uh, Bark, where have you been all these years? Um, this is a story you have to write. Um, and I, thinking about it, maybe one reason that I thought that was uh, the morning that the embassy was taken, November 4th, 1979, uh, I had gone into work. It was, a, it was a Sunday, which was the first day of our work week in Tehran. I'd gone into work uh, and I realized uh, that I looked very shaggy. I needed a haircut. And I thought, well, I could go out and get a haircut. I could go out and get a haircut, but no, that's all, uh, that's on work time. I really shouldn't do that. Um, let, let me go after work. Let me go after, uh, after work and I'll be shaggy for a day. Okay, so I didn't, and I should have gone and gotten the haircut, but I didn't. Um, and I got caught as a, re uh, as a result. Um, I spent uh, 14, month 14 months uh, as a prisoner. Um, and I often thought to myself, uh, well, suppose I had gone and gotten the haircut and the embassy was taken and then what would I have done? Then what, what would I have done? Could I have survived? Uh, what would I, how would I have, uh, could I have escaped? Uh, could I have remained un, undetected? How would I have, uh, how would I have done that? Um, and sort of coming, coming off that idea, once we said, okay, here we have the germ of a, uh, germ of a story, um, who should this be? And it was clearly not someone like me, not, uh, an identifiable Westerner like me, because it didn't matter how how good, how how well you spoke Persian or how well you 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 knew the country. Um, it needed more than that. And so we asked ourselves, what kind of a person should this uh, um, should this be? And it had to be somebody obviously who spoke the language. Uh, and someone who was um, bicultural, or probably I should say tricultural, not just an American, not uh, uh, an American Foreign Service officer, um, but also <clears throat> Iranian, but an Iranian who could adapt to the new realities of the Islamic uh, of the Islamic Republic, because the the country, the society. It changed. New, new people were in charge and the realities had changed. So, for example, symbolically, um, we had her change her name from the very Persian uh, Nilufar, which, by the way, means water lily, um, to the uh, very Islamic uh, Masume, which is a, a name also of one of the most important saints in Iran, uh, uh, in Iran, woman, uh, uh, woman uh, uh, saint. Uh, so there was the person we found, and when we decided it should be a woman, uh, I'm not sure how we came to that, but once we decided it, it was obvious that that was what we were going to do. Um, and Mark has pointed out a um, number of novels uh, or nonfiction books. Uh, about women spies. One, one other one I would mention is Ben McIntyre. Uh, oh, uh, Ben McIntyre's Agent Sonia, uh, which is a fascinating story of a woman who German woman who ended up spying for the Soviet Union for a very long time, and, and, and then had a second career. She she uh, she had all these narrow escapes. Then she had a second career as a writer of spy novels and mystery novels in East Germany after she, after she left, fled from England and ended up in East, uh, East Germany. Um, but it was, you know, again, given the realities, we she she could hide out. Um, just the dress restrictions made would make it easier. I mean, how you know, if. If you have a crowd of 2,000 people all looking exactly the same from the outside, all covered in the same way, uh, um, in the same way that's perfect to, to excuse the expression, that's perfect cover uh, for the person that we wanted to, uh, wanted to put in there. I'd also point out that um, uh, maybe we can take credit for this, but uh, women spies in um, Iran now seems to be all the rage. Uh, if you follow the uh, Israeli television series, an Israeli television series called um, uh, called Tehran, um, which in which the, the central character is this uh, Israeli of Iranian origin, um, and also the French series, the Bureau, 
uh, where uh, where they send a, um, a woman under cover of being a seismologist uh, to a French seismologist uh, uh, to Tehran. Um, I don't know. Maybe there will uh, maybe this will be a TV series at some time in the future. But you don't know. <laughs> you don't know that that's a, that's uncertain. Uh, in any case, from that uh, from that beginning, the other thing I would point out was that. Um, what struck me when Mark made the suggestion is there were a lot of things, you know, there was a lot of interesting material to make a spy historical, espionage historical novel. Um, and that uh, what, what an amazing thing it would be to put a Foreign Service political officer into the middle of all those events such as the civil strife of the eight, uh, civil strife of the 80s the fight against the mujahideen e khalq the the left uh, uh, the, the leftists the factional uh, problems uh, iran contra uh, iran contra uh, the war of the cities and so the uh, iran iraq war uh, and, and all of those events and you say you put uh, you put a political officer um, in there and think of all uh, all the amazing things that she could uh, that she could do. Uh, so really, that's the that's really the creation of the novel um, and the base uh, and the basis for it. We can go into more detail about sort of the, the techniques about it, but that's how it really got started. Thank you guys for that. Um, I'm going to uh, ask each of you a question, if I may use my power here. Um, uh, John, the heroine in the book is, as you say, a, a young and newly minted Iranian-American Foreign Service officer named Niyufar Hartman. She is asked to go to Tehran to help an overloaded consular section during the uh, early years, uh, during the early periods of the Iranian Revolution. But she arrives in Tehran on the day students invaded the embassy. She didn't know uh, that when she landed, uh, uh, just assumed there'd been a mix up in communications and went off to live with her relatives. Um, John, I'm guessing that your wife, Parvana, uh, must have helped greatly in the development of her character and this description of her blending into post revolutionary society for nine years. Um, is, that, is, that, is that the case? Uh, let me let me repeat what what both of us have often said. This is fiction. <laughs> uh, the character, the, the the characters, the situation, places are are made up. Now, having said that, um, obviously, what we learned is you, you you draw inspiration from what you know, um, and so I think most of the characters, it's fair to say, are a composite. Um, drawn from experience from people we know. There are some who are frankly uh, quite identifiable with the chain. We, some we changed the name, some we didn't, but um, in, in many cases there are times we change the names and people might know who, who we're talking about. Uh, uh, who we're talking about. Um, but again, the, the main characters um, are, are fiction uh, but you write what you know, and that the, the composites, the Iranian, the, the Iranian characters, obviously um, come uh, come out of characteristics and uh, good and bad of people that we've known over the years. Uh, Thank you. That's great, um, uh, Mark. The other main character in the book is uh, the un U.S. Undersecretary for Political Affairs. And since you're one of a handful of people who have held that position, um, and, and obviously his, uh, his, his, he too is wholly imagined, but did you pull anything from your experience in the job to, to flesh out that role, uh, you know, small group meetings and other things are in there? Well, again, um, as John said, it, it, it's fiction. And so, um, so sure, I mean, as John said, you then you take what you know, you write what you know, um, we tried to kind of build characters that were going to move the story along. Uh, it's been a wonderful thing as people have kind of criticized the book. Among the things people say, well, the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs would never have served for that long. True. The, he, that, that person would never have been able to run an agent in Tehran. True. But it's fiction. 
And so um, one, of, one of the things I, I've most enjoyed about John's presentation sometimes, John says, you know, you hear a lot this phrase, well, you can't make these things up. Well, it turns out you can make these things up, and that's what we try to do. So, sure, I mean, if you think about, and perhaps some of the people who've read the book, and I hope others will uh, buy it and read it, you know, there are descriptions of walking back from the White House back to the State Department. Well, that's something we've all done. Uh, there are descriptions about sometimes everybody who serves at senior levels in government has choices to make. You know, is this the time to resign? Is this what I'm going to do? Is this right? Um, and so I think that's just not my experience. That's the experience of everyone who's had these kinds of, had this kind of service. So as John said, we, we were inspired by what we know. We were inspired by what we learned. Um, and we tried to bring it together in the fiction. Thanks. Let me uh, just check here. Um, one thing I recognized uh, very, very clearly was uh, the uh, cheesiness of the uh, training facilities for new entrants in Roslyn as well as the eighth floor of the State Department when uh, we all entered, uh, entered the Foreign Service. So, so yes, there, there are a lot of uh, very realistic aspects to the book. Um, I know you probably been asked this before, but where did you guys come up with the spy craft in the book? Uh, although neither of you ever served in intelligence agencies, did you pick up ideas from the intelligence officers you worked with in Washington or in your overseas postings? What? It's funny you ask that, Tom. I, I just a couple of days ago got a letter from a reader um, you know, who took the trouble to actually sit down and write a, write a letter, if people still do this, um, to the publisher for us, to the publisher, sent it, sent it to us, in which you know, she says how much she loved the book, uh, but then criticized Nilufar's spycraft, uh, some of the things <laughs> you know, show she never would have done this or she never would have uh, uh, never would have done that. And all I can say is guilty as charged. Um, we, this was, this, you know, neither of us, despite the fact that um, a lot of people in the countries where I served uh, were sure, was, were absolutely certain that that was my source of, my source of income came from the CIA and, and not from the State Department uh, uh, and not from the State Department. Uh, they were the ones really paying my uh, uh, really paying my salary. Maybe they would have paid me more. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, again, this is the, it, it's a spy novel, but it's not a spy novel in um, you know things like uh, you know poison dart poison darts and uh, exploding umbrellas and this uh, uh, this kind of thing. If, if there's any for spycraft in it, it's, it's old fashioned. I mean, the, the, the way she communicates um, to her, you know, with her, uh, with Porter from, Ter from Tehran is basically something, it's one step above carrier pigeons uh, and invisible ink. I mean, it's something if you read about spies in World War I, it's the kind of thing you would, rec um, uh, uh, you would recognize. Um, and yes, we've been, you know, people have said, well, she never would have, lasted as long as she did because her spy craft, but she wasn't trained as a spy. Uh, she was not expecting to do this kind of, to, to, to have to live a false, ident um, a false identity. She was trained as a diplomat, um, not for very long. I mean, she was on her first, <laughs> she first tour. But again, maybe part of the idea is here is a woman, you know, of great resilience, intelli in, in, intelligence, courage, uh, patriotism, determination, and by God, she's going to, you know, this is what she has to do, that's what she'll do. I would say, Tom, also that uh, we did a lot of reading of other spy novels, and, and there's an enormous education to be had. You know, if you want to learn about surveillance, you read Jean Le Carré, and, and if you want to read about, you know, as John said, some of the old-fashioned ways that people communicated, you think about Ben McIntyre's book about Kim Philby, you know, how did he communicate in Beirut? Well, they moved potted plants from one side of a balcony to the other. And I think one of the interesting tensions in the book, and again, I don't want to give the story away, but while Nilofar and some of the people who are helping her are using the old-fashioned methods, actually th things go pretty well. And then, aha, technology comes, and someone comes along and says, we can do this better. Uh, and it turns out, not better. 
And so if you, if again, if a, a reading of John LaCarre, a reading of Alan First, a reading of Ben McIntyre, um, for, for our purposes anyway, gave us all the education in it that we needed. Good, I've got some questions from the, from the uh, others in the audience now. Um, Greg Thielman asked, do you plan to have the book translated into Persian? <laughs> I'll let John answer that. <laughs> oh. Good question. Good, good question. I had, would have no objection to it. Um, the one thing about if, it, if, it's, if it's translated in Persian and sold in, uh, in Iran, since Iran is not party to any copyright convention, uh, we wouldn't get a dime from it. We would get a dime from it. Yeah, it would be a pirated uh, edition, but uh, you know, I would love, uh, and, and in that, I mean, I would like to think that I could at least look at a translation because what I'm afraid of is if somebody does a translation and completely uh, uh, butchers the text, either out of you know misunderstanding or deliberately, uh, deliberately to change the uh, to change the story. Um, we had actually, I think we did have an inquiry about it at one point. But frankly, you know, if, if the, the, those who read the book, I think, will recognize uh, that at least today, uh, the authorities in the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, would probably not welcome uh, <laughs> this story and the way it goes. Having said that, uh, my re my comments, or the comments I received from Iranian readers uh, who've read the English version, have been very gratifying. And very positive, and that was very important to us. We wanted to make sure that we got the vibe right in terms of the Iranian setting and the interaction uh, um, of, of Iranians, because this was not this was not a book like uh, "Not Without My Daughter." I mean, this is not that kind of a book. That not that kind of a book to show to demean anyone, uh, demean Iranians or Americans or any uh, 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 or anyone. And, and so far, as I said, the comments coming from that side um, have been quite positive and quite gratifying. I'd say also, if I could, Tom, to Greg, uh, as, as John said, we had one inquiry, um, but the person on the other end said, well, of course, you know, we, you'd have to change this and that to make it acceptable to the government of Iran. And we said, you know, we're not doing that. So um, you, you would recognize that that's not something that we would do. And very importantly, to the point that John just made, you know, the other dedication of the book is to, you know, the people, people in Iran who've just suffered so long and so hard for kind of a decent life for their own families. And so we've been very pleased with the Iranian and Iranian-American reaction to the book. Great. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I assume you're not going to translate it into French either. Uh, yeah, they're an early villain is a Frenchman and later they're heroes. But, uh, you know, all right. <laughs> A couple of questions, a couple of more questions here. Joan Silverleaf, uh, how did she communicate without having clandestine communications training? I think you sort of answered that, but you might want to give a little more. Well, I think as, as John said, you know, she went there as trained as a diplomat, thought she was going to a consular tour, thought she was going to help out in an overwhelmed consular section, and then found herself in this situation. So there's improvisation, improvisation throughout. Um, and among them are this, again, I don't want to give the story away, but um, to uh, communication through very old fashioned method through a retail outlet, um, you know, mail drops and all the other things that, that, that you read about. Um, but again, I think very importantly, as John said, this is a story of, of creativity and resilience on her part. And, um, and, and that's what we wanted to show. And then as in answers to all questions, it's fiction. Um, and so, yes, you know, there, maybe it wouldn't have happened that way, uh, but that's how we did it. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, there's a question I think for John from Robin. Um, when you were there or when you came back to the US, what if anything did you hear about individual congressional efforts to respond to the hostage crisis? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get the question. Sure, uh, when, when you were in Iran or when you returned, what, if anything, did you hear about uh, individual congressional efforts to respond to the hostage crisis? Uh, to, to respond, to, I assume you mean, I, I assume that um, the question means to resolve it? 
I think just, uh, you know, learn about what they did to try to free you. I okay. Uh, well, I, I didn't know much. I think Mark was more in the firing line, the firing line of that. Um, there were a lot of people. I mean, one of the things that we put into the book, uh, because people who criticized us were saying, well, this is very far-fetched. This would never would have happened. Uh, but one of the things that we put in the book, which I think is accurate, uh, is uh, the U.S. The, the U.S. We, we were the, the U.S. administration, the Carter administration, was faced with an unprecedented situation, uh, and it had no sources of information. It didn't know what was going on on the ground. Um, on the ground, it was all cut off, and all normal sources were cut off. Well, what happens in that case is um, you have um, a lot of volunteers stepping forward. Um, volunteering their services for whatever reason, uh, whatever reason, saying, oh, yes, I know this Ayatollah, I know this person, I know that person, um, I can solve this, I can solve that. And for all, again, for all mixture of motives, um, the most dangerous ones, I thought, I, it always seemed to me, were the ones who said they didn't want anything. Um, they said they were just doing it for patriotic reasons. I always thought, you know, if you hear that, you run as fast as you can in the other direction. Uh, you, you run as fast as you can in the other direction. Um, so uh, I know a lot of people, you know, made a lot of efforts on our behalf, including, I mean, the, all the people, Mark and others in the, in the Near East Bureau spent long hours uh, working on our behalf, trying to do what, you know, trying, uh, 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 doing, what, doing what they could. Uh, congressionally, I know that there was a, um, the only one I really specifically remember was a Congressman Hansen from Idaho who had some contacts in, uh, contacts in Iran and I believe came over uh, at least once. Um, he visited, I believe he visited some of my colleagues. I never saw him. Uh, uh, I never saw him. Um, but I wasn't really aware of these, uh, uh, of, of most of these efforts. Um, and really, I, you, you can speculate, but again, we try to put this into the, bo uh, uh, into the book of sort of what caused, why, you know, why did the Iranians eventually willing to settle um, when they did um, on terms that they could have had months, early, uh, uh, months earlier. Um, and again, it was probably not the effort, you know, not all the well-intended mediation effort, mediation efforts, um, but basically the fact that they had worked out their own internal politics and we were no longer of any use to them. Thanks. Uh, another question from Charlie Hallahan. How did she find somebody trusted to communicate with? Well, there's a couple of parts, a couple of answers to that. Again, without giving away the story, um, in the first instance, uh, Porter finds a way to communicate with her, um, and that kind of appears. Um, and then, again, um, the main part of the book, and I think a very important section of the book, is after some time, uh, people in Washington realize they just can't leave her out there communicating in this um, quite rudimentary way. Um, and so they come up with the idea of sending someone out to help her. She, of course, resists this for some time. Uh, but in the end, they find kind of her counterpart, uh, an Iranian-American of the other side, sort of father, father Iranian, mother American. And um, he comes out and uh, helps her. Uh, they have a more systematic way of communicating. Um, but as I say, uh, then they stumble because technology comes along uh, and the simple ways become more complicated. Uh, but he also then becomes, and again, without giving too much of the story away, he becomes a very, very important character uh, in this novel. Thanks. Um, there's another one here. Hold on a minute. Um, can we ask about the lead character's work in academia in the U.S.? What did she teach? What college? What did her child do? I think that's <laughs> that's from sort of the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, uh, we put her at... Uh, um, we put her at Middlebury, Vermont. We, you know, she comes. 
again, without sort of spoiling, without giving the story away, when she, when she uh, after she spends about eight and a half years in Iran, uh, 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 in Iran, much longer than obviously she had ever intended uh, intended to, and because of a series of tragic uh, tragic events, she feels she feels betrayed and disillusioned. Uh, and she refuses to have anything to do with the U.S. government, with the with the with the U.S. government. Um, and we, we we don't go into a lot of detail about this, but she retreats into academia, uh, academia and, and we tried to find a pretty remote place for her. Uh, and so we ended up uh, having her teach at Middlebury Co at uh, uh, teach at Middlebury College. Good. Um, here's a question from Jerry Stupman. Are the authors planning to write any other books? <laughs> well, I, I can I, I try to answer the question of, is there a sequel coming? Um, I, I won't speak for John or anybody for about other books. Who knows? Um, but in terms of, a, we've been asked a lot about whether there might be a sequel here. But I will tell you, we worked so hard, and I hope people who read the book think we succeeded, we worked so hard to try to bring all the stories to an end. And, and maybe that, looking back, wasn't so smart that we didn't leave ourselves the opportunity to write a sequel. Um, but we wanted to close all the various lines out. Um, and I think we did. Um, to your previous questioner, you know, she, she goes to Middlebury, refuses to have anything to do with the United States government, but the book ends there as well. Um, and so many of the themes that we drew through the book and back at in Vermont and Middlebury there. So whether there are other books, I don't know, whether there's gonna be a sequel to this one, highly unlikely. Okay, now here's a, here's a tough question. Um, uh, have you, I mean, the first part is, have you had any movie offer, offers to turn this into a, a thriller movie? And if you, when you get them, are you gonna, who are you gonna recommend to play Niufar? And who are you gonna recommend to play the undersecretary for political affairs. <laughs> this is the you know this this is it's a it's a strange it's a strange business. How uh, of of course we'd love to see this as a as a movie or a TV ser uh, 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 TV series. I, I mentioned a couple that are already out that that are already out there, which are similar in some way, similar in some ways. Um, but it's uh, it, it's not a uh, I think we've heard it's not a straightforward process. Let me, let me just give you an example. If you watched the recent um, uh, Netflix production of A Queen's Gambit, which is just an amazing piece of, uh, 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 an amazing story, um, that was based on a novel written in 1983. So it has been almost, almost 40 years for it to reach this story. And there were, Apparently, earlier project, I mean, people read, wrote, read the novel and said, "Wow, this would be this would make a great series. This would make a great movie. Whatever it is, whatever it is." But for whatever reason, I mean, uh, you know, finance, bad luck, uh, somebody somebody moves on, somebody changes his mind, whatever it is, uh, it just doesn't happen. Uh, uh, it, it just didn't happen. So, I, I to put it, you know, I'd love to see, for example. Uh, Nazanin Bonyadi or Golshifte Farhani, or Golshifte Farhani, who was brilliant in uh, the movie Patterson, opposite Adam Driver. If you remember that movie, uh, 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 that movie, um, I'd love to see one of them in that uh, that role. Who is Porter? I, I don't. Uh, uh, I really don't know. It's hard to say that. Uh, that's hard to say. Um, but at least I, I think I think we have to sort of go on and not expect uh, and not expect a deluge of offers uh, from companies wanting to turn this into a movie or a TV series. But that said, if anybody out there's got a lead, got a lead we'll take it. Um, I, I would say also one of the amusing things has been that right away, early on, people would write to us and say, I'll grow a beard, I'd like to play the Ayatollah Khomeini. So we have a long list of people who are ready to play the Ayatollah Khomeini. Right. Well, all I can say is whoever uh, plays Porter would have to be at least as good looking as you are, Mark. So, oh, yeah. you know, that would. <laughs> all right. A um, couple more here. They're pouring in. Um, 
This is from Carol Cochran. We learned that candidate Reagan has made a deal with the Ayatollah to, had made a deal with the Ayatollah to wait until his inauguration before the Ayatollah would release you and your fellow hostages. Was that true? Uh, in a word, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, that story has been out there now for 40 years, for, for 40 years, for over 40, uh, 40 years. Um, no one, no, no one's ever come forward with evidence to prove it. Um, is it possible? Yes. Uh, you know, I have I always had this gut feeling. Yeah, something, something was going, something was going on there. And we, um, we do uh, make a small reference to the to that event and that possibility in the book without going explicitly. We can, I can say, I think, without spoiling, uh, we don't have any meetings. Uh, between the Reagan administration and the Iranians in the book, uh, 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 in the book. Uh, but we do have sort of a small indication that would say, well, maybe there was something, maybe there was something there. But it would be fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, okay, uh, here's a question from Paul Gade. Have either of you ever visited Middlebury College? If so, was it during the time frame of the novel? <laughs> Uh, yes, again, uh, on this theory of writing what you know, that's why uh, we know a little, I, I, uh, we spend a lot, uh, our family spends a lot, some time up in that part of, uh, that part of Vermont. Um, and we know that area, we, so we, we know that area pretty well, particularly there's a scene um, on the, uh, the, the scene at the end of the book on the, near the end of the book on the uh, Robert Frost Trail. Uh, which is very close to Middlebury, which is which is very close to Middlebury, and it's one of those beautiful places in the whole. I think it's one of those beautiful places in the whole state, if not in the country, uh, if not in the country. And we put we put a crucial scene right there, uh, uh, right there. So again, it just goes back to the thing: write what you know, write about what you know, write about places you know. It would have been hard, I think, to to locate this in somewhere. Out in Montana or somewhere where we, we really don't, which we really don't know that well. I would say, Tom, if you just, I, I hope I know there are more questions, but I think it's worthwhile also. I just wanted to say to the audience um, that we got, there were people who were just so generous with their ideas and with their time, people who'd written novels, people who had ideas for us. And one of the things that um, people said was, write what you know. You, know, don't, you have to find some grounding um, for this fiction and what it is that you know. People gave us wonderful, wonderful suggestions. People gave us a lot of time. But one of the most wonderful and, and early suggestions that we got was make sure there's a villain on every page. You know, make your villains very powerful. Um, we got some other great, um, great suggestions. And so as people will see in the acknowledgements, you know, this turns out to be a team sport like a lot of other things. And uh, I just wanted to say this wasn't a, it wasn't, it wasn't an isolating experience. People were just wonderful, wonderful answering questions, helping us out. It was great. This, this would never have seen the light of day without yeah. the advice we got, because some of it, I mean, it was just crucial, uh, crucial to us. And um, what happens if you, if you ever are writing a novel um, and you want to find out who your real friends are, <laughs> ask them look at the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> because it can be pretty excruciating, <laughs> a real test of friendship. Um, but we had people were incredibly generous, and, and, you know, incredibly generous. Um, and we needed someone to tell us, uh, you know, this doesn't work. Um, or you need to limit, you know, you need to cut this way down. One of the, one of the best uh, pieces of advice we got, I mean, Mark mentioned the villains, which was excellent. The other was... Uh, um, from a from a reader who said, uh, you know, he said there are too many. Uh, uh, said that you have so many Iranian names in there, uh, too many Z's in the novel. In the novel, take those uh, take the take those out. And you know, without that kind of without that kind of advice, I don't think the uh, I don't think I don't think we would have made it through the project. Yeah. Yeah. More questions flooding in. For both authors, can you talk a little about the process of collaborating on plot lines? Did you have disagreements about which way the story developed and how did you resolve them? Well, I should say, um, I can't, I, what we did was one of our objectives was 
to see if we could write a novel in which nobody could tell who wrote which chapter. So people couldn't say, oh, John Limbert wrote that chapter, Mark Rosen wrote the other. And so from the very beginning, we kind of laid out a very, comp a very comprehensive kind of storyboard, if you will, or heavy outline of where we wanted to go. And then we each took chapters. And obviously we took chapters that made more sense perhaps for one or the other of us to start with. But then over a couple of years, we just, we shipped them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we did them in a totally random way. We said, okay, this time you look at all the odd number chapters and I'll look at all the even number chapters. And then we would swap. And so over a period of a couple of years, they became very melded, we hope, um, between the two of us. Um, we also twice went over it sentence by sentence by sentence um, so that we could say, you know, let's make sure this is, let's make sure it's right, that it's the best we can do, but that it's in, um, that it's in both of our voices. Um, so we tried very hard to do that. The other thing I would say to the question, which is a great one, is that, and I, I had no idea, I'd never written any fiction before, but you read sometimes, fiction writers say that the story takes over and the story sometimes told us which way to go. And so there were points at which we would come up to a fork in the road or an idea and somehow the story and the character said, go this way. And um, so I don't remember any great disagreements um, because we, 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 we wanted to have this collaboration. We wanted it to be seamless. And in the end, we wanted the story to tell itself. We, we did, we had a lot of discussion over the, over how to end it. Yeah. I know that was, uh, that was, comp that, that was probably the hardest, the hardest part. We didn't, we didn't really argue about it. It was just that we went through different endings and sort of said, well, what, what works, what, um, um, what doesn't work. And in the end, uh, we came up with a more, with a, 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 a positive ending. Uh, which we didn't have to necess necessarily, but I think uh, I think we and from the comments we've gotten from readers, uh, readers seem to be pleased uh, with the way the way we brought things to a relatively positive uh, conclusion. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great ending. Um, okay, back to a movie cast. Who might play Sadeg Gotspede? I'm not don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I knew him when he was a student at Georgetown. Very handsome. This is from Joan Silverly. Well, he's not. He's not in the. Uh, he's not in the book. I didn't. I didn't remember him. Yeah. He's not in the book, but he's obviously on the margins, and there are references to him. I would. Um, I'd recommend a, 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 an amazing account, nonfiction work by uh, the Canadian journalist Carol Jerome, uh, who knew Hutzade very well. Uh, at the time, and she did, a, she's done a book called uh, The Man in the Mirror, uh, which if I had read this before we did the novel, I would have worked in some of the incidents, because there are some wonderful incidents uh, involving Woods, uh, 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 involving Woods Sunday, and we put it, put it, we, uh, we, we could have put him in there. Uh, maybe if we do a second edition, uh, <laughs> We can put something about that in, uh, about in there, but uh, you know, again, some things you just you know are are, are left on the cutting room floor. Sure. Um, here's one. How come I can't find the book in the Arlington Library catalog? <laughs> well, I, I hope you will so soon. Um, <clears throat> when we got this wonderful invitation from the Encore Learning and the Library, um, I was asked to see if I could get the book into the catalog. Uh, it turns out there's a path to do so for Arlington authors. I'm sure things are really slow because of COVID, um, but I uh, recommended it, said they were uh, joining us today and said there's a Kindle edition. Um, I also donated a, a hard copy um, as I was supposed to. So I hope sometime soon uh, there'll be a positive decision and it will be at the library. Great, very nice. Um... Okay, a couple more about the writing, uh, the joint writing. I'm gonna read several of these and I think you've already answered them partially. The one is, uh, as co-authors, how did you coordinate your writing, each responsible for a separate chapter, <coughs> second reading? Um, any, um, any other thoughts on that? Only when Mark has, just, has described how we, you know, the, how we did this back and forth, uh, one of the things that the Foreign Service taught me is to have no pride of authorship at all. 
you know, you're, <laughs> that's right. you know, so anything you write is going to be edited by at least a dozen people before it ever sees the light of, uh, before it ever sees the light of day. Um, so you do not get, you know, if, 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 Someone says, uh, someone says, well, this could be better written this way or this could be taken out. Um, you, you never take that person uh, personally because if you did, you'd never survive in our profession. May I also say, I, I just, I'm just going to steal one of John's better lines, is the other thing that we found in, in doing this together was uh, it was great to have a co-author because you had a commitment to someone else. And so if we said, we're going to have these chapters done by Thursday, um, you know, I was committed. Um, I had a partner. I had somebody I had to meet my obligations to. I, I think you could see how if you were doing this by yourself, you'd say, hey, uh, you know, I I'll get to that tomorrow or the next day or the next day and nothing might ever happen. But we were, you know, we were committed to each other. And if, if we made a promise for Thursday, we tried to keep it. But that's a great, that's a great answer because you, you do hear about uh, writers' procrastination when they're on their own. Um, okay, uh, coming from careers that involve the kind of writing you did, how did you create or get inside the heads of your characters? This is from Dick Junkie. Well, Dick, I, I'd say that, um, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you for participating. Thank you for the question. Um, we, we, one of the good things about this collaboration was that it, it not only took in the careers that we had, but of course, and again, mostly on John's side, and I'll just give him all the credit here, is the ability to get inside of the heads of the Iranian characters as well, especially family members and the society there. Um, and as I said, we tried to be within the rules and regulations of fiction, we tried to be as, as clear as we could about what goes on um, in, people's, in people's minds. I mean, I think if you, if you, if you were to consider the book um, and, and, and the themes that came out of it, I think one of the reasons that certain themes reappeared uh, was because we were able to think, well, what would it be like to be in that person's shoes? What would it be like to be that person? And whether it was Porter or Nilofar or characters on the Iranian side, but you think about, you know, in people's heads, so service, right? That goes across the book. You think about patriotism and not the kind of blood and soil nationalism, but people are really patriotic about their, con their country. And that comes out at the end of the book where there are patriots in Iran um, and patriots in the United States as well. Family, I think every character deep inside them has a very important component of family. And that helped us get inside of people's heads. And as John mentioned also resilience. Um, we started thinking, you know, these are resilient people, Nilofar to start, but, but all of the characters. And for our lives, if you're going to succeed in the Foreign Service or succeed representing the United States of America abroad, as so many others and other agencies do, resilience very high up on that list. Um, so we, again, we tried to imagine what it would be like to be that person. Um, one of the other interesting things about fiction, again, besides this kind of the story writes itself, Dick, is that I've written a little bit of nonfiction, a chapter here, a chapter there, but I never once got up in the middle of the night thinking about dialogue and what would my characters be saying to each other. And numerous times during the writing of this book, I would just be awake at three or four o'clock in the morning. And clearly your mind is trying to get into everybody else's head. And how would they talk to each other? What would they be saying? What would it be like? So it's a very compelling question of how you get into other people's heads. This, this you have, I mean, this is really different. This we have to learn because, it, you know, to do this, di to get this dialogue right, to, to get this dialogue right. We, we worked hard on it. I think one of the things we did was uh, to do, uh, as Mark mentioned, we read an awful lot of other people's fiction, uh, spy fiction. And maybe that was probably, um, maybe that was one of the best things about the whole project. It was the chance to uh, to read a, a lot of good um, historical and and some not so good um, historical and uh, and and espionage novels. Here, I've got uh, a couple of questions left. I think I'll pose them, uh, and then our time will be up. Um, uh, two of them uh, have to do with your publisher. I'm going to combine them. One is from Millie Lawson. Tell us about your publisher, and another one from Diane Markowitz. How did you get the book published? Uh, 
Okay, now that's a good question. That's a that, that, that's a very good question because it's 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 no small thing. If you look at uh, experience, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are doing self published you know, doing doing self publishing these days. But I we we worked through. Um, uh, I mean, we we walked around a lot of people, and you you know, one thing you learn, and maybe this is good foreign service training too, is uh, you learn to live with rejection. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know. I always like the story that um, the 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 novelist, the Harry Potter novels, got turned down what seventeen or eighteen times before she found someone to publish her book. Uh, 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 publish her books. Um, I mean, what's, what's remarkable to me is so much. There's a lot of good stuff out there that either never gets published or never gets recognized, and then there's a lot of frankly, there's a lot of dreck that does. Um, and it's it's a, it's absolutely it's absolutely amazing. But we knew I knew of the we, we published it through uh, Mazda Press, which is a small which is an independent press in um, Orange County, uh, Orange County, California. And this is, frankly it was an operation that I knew and respected for uh, for about twenty years for uh, uh, for about twenty years. And he stayed. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Jabari is the head of the, the head of this, and he uh, has done a lot of good work on um, Iranian subjects, but others to other two uh, uh, Middle Eastern, both fiction um, and nonfiction. One of the things that he did early on to help us, and he was very very helpful, gave us a lot of good uh, good advice early on. Um, he sent us uh, some of the other novels that he had published, and some of the biographies that uh, he published. And in the acknowledgments, I acknowledge some of the things that we uh, we lifted from those uh, 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 from from those accounts. Um, very helpful stuff. So it was very you know it was very easy working uh, uh, working with him. And I'd like to just give him a give him a shout out and and thanks for uh, being so patient. Yes, I'd say uh, thank him for being patient. The other thing I would say, if you'd allow me, um, is that the other really fun thing was, um, people who may have seen the cover of the book, um, we had it done, this is original artwork actually, um, and in talking to uh, Dr. Jabari about what should be on the cover, he had some ideas, we had some ideas, uh, but we found a young Iranian American um, photographer uh, who helped us design the front and the back cover and I think it's fantastic that we were able to um, have something original uh, for it. Um, and so, uh, again, as John often says, you can get the Kindle edition because it comes just like that. Um, we like people to, we hope, uh, get the paperback because you get an original piece of artwork thrown in. Yeah, I, I think the artwork on this is, is, is well worth the price. Well worth the price. <laughs> uh, our photographer, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Nostrati, uh, uh, Mr. Taraki, uh, also, I mean, he, he's a family opera, family and friends operation. The the, the model for the uh, the photograph on the cover is his wife, his wife Stephanie, um, and he found a calligrapher in Tehran, uh, Mr. Shariva Shariwari, uh, who did the calligraphy. And for for anyone who uh, knows Persian, there's the line. There's a line of poetry which from Hafiz, which is basically "See our, see our deepest secrets," which is a line of poetry that then figures well into the story. Okay, I have one final question from Paul Gade. Will there be an audio book edition? Well, one of the things we've learned uh, from the publisher, we've learned a lot of things about the economics of all of this. Um, and I think the answer to the question is, it has to sell a little bit more uh, before he's going to invest in an audio edition. We'd love to do one. Um, we've, we've read some of it. We've read it to each other. We've read it to some audiences. We, we've enjoyed it a lot. Um, so, and I'd love to learn and see how it all works. But um, I think he'd like, to, he'd like to be sure he could make, a little, make, make his money back on an audio edition. Well, I'm sure the 120 plus uh, participants today will put you over that uh, threshold. So, um, thank, and thank you, all kidding aside, thank you both for, uh, for really a, a great hour. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the book and uh, I think everybody else uh, who gets it will too. So, thanks much.
Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, John, Mark, uh, audience, for writing the book. Audience for really excellent discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, John and Mark, for writing the book and for joining us to uh, tell us about your experience. And uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, moderating the event. And uh, appreciate to all of you, appreciate the audience uh, joining us. So.